Good morning, everyone, and a very well, very warm welcome to today's mini webinar or mini conference, I should say, or webinar on digitalization in employment and guidance services, how apps and algorithms are changing the face of welfare delivery. And the seminar is being hosted by the Maynooth University Social Sciences Institute and the Department of Sociology. And it's a joint initiative of two projects on activation reform that we have housed within these two departments. The first is the project, a collaborative approach to public building public employment services funded by the Irish Research Council and led by Professor Mary Murphy in collaboration with Dr. Nuala Wienel. And the second is a project, a Horizon 2020 funded study of public employment services contracting that I'm leading with Mary Murphy as well, called the Governance of Activation in Ireland. Um, the topic of today's seminar, really the role of apps, algorithms and digital platforms in public employment services, might seem somewhat ancillary to the focus of these two projects. However, it was motivated by a conference that we convened a couple of months ago on High Road Back to Work, um, which I know many of you were at in early June. And that conference was about setting out a vision for a, the role of a public employment services ecosystem in enabling a post-COVID recovery, um, recognizing the unprecedented challenge now facing the capacity of public employment services given the scale of pandemic unemployment. And particularly we know in this country that that's an, a hugely emerging issue from March of next year. Um, and one of the things that we identified in our report that we launched in that conference was the potential that digitalization might play in enhancing or building the capacity of the public employment services to provide employment support services to um, facilitate a quick return to work. Um, while at the same time recognizing that there are important concerns about the risks of digital exclusion, uh, issues around lack of digital literacy among some cohorts and access barriers around lack of broadband infrastructure in some parts of the country, and especially the challenge of assessing and accurately profiling job seekers so that we can reliably distinguish between those who are job ready and who would benefit very well from an online services platform and those who are perhaps more removed or further distant from employment and require more face-to-face -face intensive support. Um, that being said though, there are a number of opportunities presented by digitalization to free up what are likely to, to be increasingly scarce, scarce and stretched case management resources in the public employment services. This is not only an issue in Ireland, but also more widely internationally and especially in other European countries. And already before COVID, Several countries, most notably Belgium and Australia, which we're going to hear a little bit about this morning, had embarked upon this path well before COVID. But the COVID crisis has certainly elevated the digitalization of public employment services to the top of the activation reform agenda. And we see this, uh, we have seen this recently in the Irish Labour Market Advisory Council's policy paper on preparing for economic recovery, which explicitly called for more activation in job search support services to be provided via digital platforms and online channels. And I'm delighted to say that we have the chair of the Irish Labour Market Advisory Council, John Martin, joining us as the discussion for this morning's session. And if any of you were at the NERI annual Labour Market Conference yesterday, you will also have heard senior policy advisors from the Department of Employment Affairs and Social Protection talking about how the current uh, public employment services engagement model delivered by Intrio will need to be adapted and augmented with digitalized and online services as part of a strategy of living with COVID, which we're now going to be expecting to be living with for at least the next nine months, if not many, much longer than this. So the purpose of today's talk, uh, of today's webinar, is really to talk through and think through what are some of the opportunities and challenges presented by digitalization for the future of how welfare and employment services will be delivered. Uh, and doing this in a very open-ended way, recognizing that there are both positives and negatives um, associated with apps and algorithms in service delivery, but how can we sort of reconcile those two aspects? Um, and this is an issue not only in Ireland, but in internationally as well, hence the international flavor of this morning's session in particular, but also the conference more generally today. So what do exactly do we mean by digitalization in, a service delivery context, to what extent is it about harnessing AI and machine learning versus more prosaic forms of automation and 
servicing. And I think a banking analogy may be a helpful way of thinking about this. Are we in the domain of kind of dumb transactional ATM machines for depositing and withdrawing information, or cash in this case, or are we in the, the sphere of smartphone applications that can harness our behavioral patterns to model our financial futures and recommend suggested courses of action for averting crises? Um, where are apps and algorithms currently being deployed in the public employment services delivery supply chain? Are we talking about the stages of initial triaging and profiling of clients? Ongoing case management support, what's the potential there and what's the potential for post-placement support? And also what's the potential for uh, in enhancing employer engagement in active labor market challenges? And importantly, what are the various opportunities and challenges associated with each of those different forms that digitalization might take? So to explore these and very other pertinent questions, I'm delighted to say that we've got a highly experienced panel of presenters from across the globe. I think we're, trans we're transversing four time zones possibly in this presentation. So we have Ludo Struven, who's an associate professor and head of research on education and labor market at the University of Louvain in Belgium. We have Ray Griffin, who's lecturer in strategic management at Waterford Institute of Technology and the principal investigator of the uh, HACAT project, which is exploring disrupt disruptive technologies supporting labor market decision making support. We have Simone Casey, who's a research associate at the think tank per capita in Melbourne, and also a fellow of the Future Social Sciences Institute at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. And we have Joe Ingold, who's an associate professor in the Department of Management at Deakin University in Melbourne, but who many of you may also know from her, her role as an associate professor in human resources management and public policy previously at Leeds University. Um, so the format for this morning is we will have four presentations of 15 minutes or so, and that will be followed by a discussion of those presentations from John Martin. And then I will open up the panel to questions from the audience. And you'll see on, your, on the bottom of your Zoom screen that there's a Q&A option there. So that's where to place questions as they come up during the presentations. And then I will, I will pitch those, presentate, those questions to the panelists when we move on to the discussion time. Um, broadly, the first two presentations will look at the use of AI and algorithms in sort of the profiling and assessment of job seekers. And the second two presentations will look at some of the experiments and innovations that are going on in the domain of kind of online case management support and on, online job search support for job seekers, focusing on developments in Australia and the UK as well. So without further ado, um, let's commence with Ludo Struven, who as I said is the head of education and labor market research group at the Hyde Institute at the, and also professor, associate professor in the sociology of education and work at the University of Louvain, and its research covers a wide range of areas related to activation, including the dynamics and transformations of the labor market, lifelong learning and employability, contracting out of public and employment services, and most recently, he's been doing a number of studies on the use of AI in um, statistical profiling tools for triaging job seekers based on their um, assessed risk of long term unemployment. Um, and he has co-authored a review of statistical profiling tools for the OECD, as well as a very re recent study of AI-driven profiling tools in the Flemish public employment service, which he is going to talk to us this morning about. So Ludo, if you would like to start sharing your screen, and then I will step away. Okay, um, okay. so um, the topic of um, of what I had to tell today is uh, about the profiling system that is used in the Flemish uh, Public Employment Service. And uh, my main concern is about fairness. That's why we talk uh, of a, a trade-off, a trade-off between accuracy and equity. Go to the second slide. Not manage it myself. Okay. Um, as we know, um, AI innovations are evolving rapidly in public employment services, and um, there are two important um, issues here. First of all, um, it means that, um, strictly spoken, that decision-making is based on machines, replacing the human judgment. Eh? Although 
in practice, uh, it depends on uh, which rule case workers um, will have and uh, what the aim is of the um, AI innovation. Is it to replace job seekers or is it to support uh, the, the case workers? And um, secondly, AI has already been used, uh, for instance, uh, to suspend welfare payments without notice, but um, it may also be used in a more positive way to um, support job seekers and to support case workers. And in that sense, AI is even considered a, a promising avenue to improve the cost efficiency and also the customization of delivering public services. Uh, with regard to the policy context, that's the next slide. Profiling and targeting, um, it's already an old issue in public employment services, as you all know, and uh, it has uh, to do with classification and segmentation of job seekers. Uh, in a context of limited resources, how can we uh, detect the most vulnerable job seekers eh, in order to uh, devote uh, limited resources to them? So the, the point of um, early identification and prevention um, of uh, high-risk job seekers eh, uh, is very important in the context of uh, um, profiling because um, the focus for policy intervention uh, has been shifted uh, to the initial period uh, of the unemployment spell. Um, and it's also important uh, in the context of making uh, benefits more conditional or more limited in time, which is a, a hot issue uh, nowadays in the Belgian context. And Next slide, please. There are three types of profiling. First of all, there is the more classic uh, way of uh, profiling models based on administrative criteria. For instance, the low educated people or uh, uh, young people or older people or combination of both. Uh, this type of uh, models require normative choices and they are also often part dependent. A second way of profiling is also a very classical uh, way of doing uh, the profiling and the targeting. And um, in this case, it's the caseworker, um, the caseworkers in judgment um, who will decide. And we know from research that caseworkers' discretion may lead to different outcomes for similar job seekers. And that's the reason, or one of the reasons, why statistical profiling gained uh, much more importance uh, the last decades, during the last decades, because um, those models use a statistical model that predicts the likelihood of work resumption and um, the, these models are often considered as a more objective approach. And AI may be seen as the next step of statistical profiling. A next step which um, is even more uh, objective than the uh, statistical profiling models that we know from, from the past. And that's explained. The next slide, please. Um, so the, the aim is to predict the job seekers likelihood of resuming work uh, within a certain period, for instance, uh, within six months in, in the Belgian case, using machine learning techniques and, um, and often including many more variables. And, the so-called big data. And um, it's also um, useful because it may give input into targeting of services or, and programs and also tailoring to job seekers' needs. 
So the main advantages of AI-based profiling models is that they are more flexible because especially when they are based on administrative data, they can be updated continuously. And um, uh, they also learn the, the data or the algorithm is also trained um, uh, continuously. And this will in general lead to more accurate predictions of course, but the question now is, may it also lead uh, to more discrimination uh, or can they better help to avoid discrimination? So this is the central question of um, our research. Does AI-based profiling improve the early identification of job seekers um, who have the higher risk of becoming long-term unemployed? And um, we um, investigated this by comparing um, the AI-based profiling to more classical ways of classi classifying job seekers. And we explored also the trade-off between accuracy uh, on the one hand and uh, fairness or equity on the other hand. Therefore, we obtained uh, access to the output of an, uh, the AI model of the VDRB. Um, it's a model um, that exists already two years now, in November of, of this year, it will exist two years. And um, we used a version from uh, January 2018 to do our research. We received uh, not only uh, the profiling scores of this model, but also a number of other data. Um, VDRP is well known for, for its uh, rich data sources, um, data on personal characteristics, uh, but also on uh, activities of job seekers in their personal platform, the click data. Um, and we also had the opportunity to use in our research very sensitive uh, data on gender, on origin, on nationality, uh, data that are not integrated in the current model uh, because it's forbidden uh, in the context of GDPR. Um, so then um, what we see from those data is first of all, and that's interesting, when, um, yeah, that's the next uh, slide, please, yeah. Um, when we see that um, the median profiling score is about 54%, and we see that uh, more or less a quarter uh, has a profiling score lower than 39%, whereas a quarter has a profiling score higher than 67%. And here the box plots are drawn by job seekers' characteristics. So uh, the variables that are used in the, the classical ways of uh, profiling uh, based on simple uh, characteristics of job seekers, rule-based. And what we see is that there is quite some overlap in the distribution across groups. For instance, uh, we see that half of the low skilled have a higher score or uh, the same score more or less than a quarter of the medium skilled job seekers. So that means um, that single criteria um, are not that uh, accurate to predict the chances of uh, uh, work resumption. That's already a first indication. Then we turn to our methodology on the next slide. And what we did is we did a comparison between uh, three ways of uh, profiling. Uh, the first way uh, is just the randomly classification of job seekers as high risk. Then uh, the second model is based on uh, the classification of job seekers as high risk in the case of low skilled based on the, the uh, educational level and then the first model is based on the profiling score uh, as we saw it also in the previous uh, slide. 
The next slide, please. Accuracy and fairness are two main criteria uh, to evaluate uh, AI applications. And um, what do we mean with it? Uh, let me say that accuracy, in our case, is not um, uh, defined as technical accuracy. It's not defined in terms of the precise of the measurement, but it is defined as the share of job seekers that are correctly identified as high or low risk job seekers. So this may be understood as predictive accuracy. Fairness, on the other hand, is defined as follows. If job seekers or disadvantage of disadvantaged groups that find the job exposed are more likely to be misclassified as high risk job seekers ex ante relative to this proportion among the dominant group. So we use this as a definition for statistical discrimination. This uh, discrimination as a ratio. Um, and uh, what we want to measure is uh, the number of false positives in our case. False positives, um, that means that um, people from certain groups, in our case the, the group of uh, uh, job seekers of foreign origin compared to the the job seekers okay? um, are they um, uh, misclassified um, in in which way uh, are they more likely to be misclassified compared to the Belgian job seekers okay? um, and we call it discrimination although this can be understood as discrimination in a positive sense eh? because uh, that would mean that uh, if they are misclassified they receive earlier more intensive services than uh, uh, what should be needed uh, without the misclassification without the discrimination maybe that's a point uh, we can come back to in the discussion on the next slide we have um, the, the figures for the accuracy and discrimination in each of the three uh, cases. The first selection rule, the pure random labeling and classifying of job seekers. Um, and um, here we see that there is a small difference in accuracy. The Belgian uh, job seekers uh, uh, have um, a score of 51% compared to the foreign job seekers, 45%. And in the second and also in the third model, especially in the third model, the AI-based model, here we see that there is no difference anymore in accuracy between both groups. Although what we see is that there is a big difference um, in the discrimination uh, we see that um, Belgian job seekers eh, risk to be misclassified in 15, 14 or 15% of the cases compared to 38, 39% uh, for the foreign job seekers. Eh. So that means that foreign job seekers are 2.6 times more likely to be misclassified as high risk compared to Belgian job seekers. So this comparison illustrates already the trade-off between accuracy and equity. We see that AI-based profiling is the most accurate compared to the other ways of profiling, but inevitably entail statistical discrimination. And in the next slide, um, we... Uh, just two more minutes, please. Thank you. Yeah, in the next slide, we uh, have the figures. Let's uh, turn to the figures. Yes, here. Um, what we did is we have visualized this trade-off and that can help to discuss the issue also with stakeholders and uh, past professionals who are less familiar with statistical models. And um, uh, what we see in the first figure, the top left, 
this figure shows the relation between the threshold and the share of job seekers identified as high risk. And the higher the threshold, the more job seekers labeled as high risk, but the proportion of foreign job seekers decreases with the threshold. Then the top right here, this um, is uh, the inverse U-shaped relationship between the threshold and accuracy. But this is the well-known trade-off between identifying too few job seekers or too many job seekers. Then um, we have the third figure, the bottom left. This um, uh, is related to the first figure, the top left. Hmm? This shows the negative relation between the threshold and discrimination. So discrimination decreases with the higher threshold. And that's because the share of foreign job seekers among the high risk also decreases with the threshold, as we saw on the top left. And then we have the bottom right. Uh, there, this, is, um, this figure is the combination of the second and the third figure. And this is again a U-shaped relation. So that means that higher accuracy increases discrimination up to a point when accuracy starts decreasing while discrimination continues to increase. And this is important um, because um, in, uh, when uh, considering the relationship between accuracy and uh, discrimination, the threshold is important and the PES can make decisions um, to make another threshold to distinguish between low risk job seekers and high risk job seekers. In the next slide, um, I summarized um, what I told now um, in a couple of conclusions, but let's turn to the discussion and that's the last slide. And um, so the main point of uh, this research is that discrimination matters also in a context of AI profiling. And, but there are two important issues. First, it depends on how the model is used. Is it used purely to automate decision making or is it used to support caseworkers and to, lay the dis to, to give the decision to the caseworkers? Secondly, it depends also on the value of the services offered. Um, are the services to be offered, are they meant uh, to support job seekers or are they meant to monitor and control the job seekers? And that brings me to the last point and that's the role of caseworkers. Um, um, well, what we observe is that AI models will only uh, support caseworkers if there is trust among caseworkers in the model. So cru crucial to the operation of the PES is how to integrate these models into decision-making processes. That's the end of my presentation. Um, you can read more about it, uh, especially in the first publication, which is online already, and um, it's a publication in the Journal of Social Policy on our QC equity trade-off. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ludo. That was a, a fascinating research that you've been doing and uh, you handled the technical difficulties with Zoom webinars tremendously well. So uh, apologies that we had difficulty initially with the sharing of the video, but um, stellar work in, in overcoming those challenges. Um, so we'll proceed now. Ray Griffin, who, as I said, is in strategic management at the Institute of Technology and known to many of you for his work with Tom Boland on the sociology of unemployment in Ireland and their associated studies on the pathways to works reform. Uh, and as I said earlier, he's currently a PI on a major Horizon 2020 project, the HACAT project, which is looking at the role of disruptive technologies in supporting labour market decision making. And the goal of this project, as, as I understand it, is really to develop an ethical algorithmic based platform to assist public employment services and un unemployed people in making informed, transparent and integration integrated decisions 
through working with unemployed people rather than working on them. Um, and Ray is going to tell us more about what that, what that means. So over to you, Ray. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the, the invitation and um, to be platformed in such great company. So I'll just start my PowerPoint and I'll try and travel through this as quickly as possible. Um, so I started studying unemployment with Tom Boland in 2012. And um, the work that I'm presenting here today grew out of an Irish Research Council New Horizon Award from a number of years back that has now become a Horizon 2020 uh, platform. And that's really allowing me work with really interesting people in, um, from across Europe. Um, we've, we're only finding our feet with the project. So, um, you know, it's great. it was great to see uh, Ludo's presentation because um, it, Ludo's work would be uh, a significant point of inspiration for us. Uh, the kind of work we're doing is uh, based on, or the, the other kind of type of inspiration we take from it is uh, Bruno Latour and Michelle Collins' work on markets and actor network theory. And we're trying to, because it's a, a H2020, we have a responsibility to produce, produce something novel and try and break out of the, um, the current state of the art. Um, uh, so it, it's ongoing work and uh, I'm really interested. This is the first time I've, I've really talked about it publicly. So I'm kind of excited and slightly uh, terrified as well. So um, if I can let my slides go forward. Oh, there we go. So um, this is our current thinking within the consortium of the landscape of technology. And it's uh, prepared by uh, one of our partners. Um, Pavel Boschkowski. And the grey area are the existing state-of-the-art uh, approaches uh, to modelling the labour force um, using statistical analysis, mainly log, log it and probe it models. And the green area there is to use more advanced maths, uh, mathematical techniques uh, in profiling and modelling. Um, the other area, the kind of mud um, and to teal area, is, is where we're currently thinking um, of uh, possibly having a better, um, better impact by studying network flows using microdata. And that's, that's kind of our current thinking. Um, so, um, and again, I'm borrowing from other people's work. Uh, and indeed, uh, this uh, uh, is... Um, is uh, from base, it's an, uh, an enhancement of the work that Ludo did in 2018 and 2019 based on an OECD workshop. It's quite hard to put together what every country is doing and getting into their actual approach um, in detail to try and kind of um, categorize and uh, benchmark uh, what, is, what is the standard for these technologies, these emerging technologies. But what we can say is about a third of all OECD members are using statistical profiling to ration care uh, to the unemployed. And it makes an awful lot of institutional sense. Uh, you have a collection of unemployed people signing on, and some of them are frictionally uh, unemployed. They're short term and they'll uh, find their feet in the labor market and they need minimal intervention. And obviously, uh, PEZ organizations working in a kind of bureaucratic um, logics want to maximize the efficiency of their service by targeting individuals where they feel they're, um, they, can, they can have the greatest impact. And so profiling is, is back, um, back in fashion um, as, a, as, as a mode of delivering PEZ services. It's fiercely contested um, and yet widely used. It's also really important to say it's, it's a hybrid between people and computers and models and data. And most systems have a human override. So it is a tool, and tool is the appropriate word because it's you know, something that lays on the consultant's uh, workbench and they can use it as they see fit and they can use different tools. Um, 
But the vision and the digital by default vision is that it stops being a tool and it becomes the service. And that over time, um, the human component diminishes and the amount of manual intervention diminishes in the service and the amount of technology is brought up um, to become more systemic. The, um, this is the general model um, that we see. And again, it's an extrapolation of, um, of, of that OECD work um, in which you start with um, the unemployed person signing on you use um, statistical markers, um, ideally objective numerical ones, um, you feed it into some kind of model, you stream people into a high risk of long-term unemployment or frictionally unemployed, and if they're at a risk of long-term unemployment, you use increased um, activation methods, um, carrots and sticks, whereas individuals who are identified as frictional have a um, more just a transfer payment and have minimal uh, down of these elaborate services that public employment systems are developing. So the work we're doing at the moment is to offer a ethical, social, theological and technical review of, of these algorithms. So, and this is kind of the meat of my presentation uh, with you today. We start with the unemployed person um, or the job seeking person and the raw material for the technology is the person signing on. We, in that, we're quite uh, conflicted. Um, all public employment systems, all academics um, are quite conflicted on the two versions of unemployment. What, you would kind of call unemployment 1.0 and job seeking 2.0. So the origin of unemployment uh, comes in the history of European violence. Uh, the kind of one of the early mentions of it is in the Treaty of Versailles that went on to create the International Labour Organization and in turn created the standard statistical definition of unemployment, which is not working, available for work and seeking work. Two of those statuses were privileged in the first half of the last century as unemployment became widespread across um, the OECD uh, world and uh, ILO world. Uh, and the seeking work is a more ambiguous, um, on, on measurable construct, um, more an aspiration uh, at the start, uh, but increasingly now being regularized and metricized. So in the 1960s and 1970s, this, the construct of unemployment goes through a transformation where the problem of stagnation and welfare dependency is, emerge as the problem to be addressed. And the response to that is active labor market policies. And present in all, um, in all policy is those two visions of unemployment. They're unresolved, but to, to produce a digital system that is uh, rule-based and fixed, you need actually to resolve that political conundrum, or at least draw a line in the stand on where you sit between those two, um, two visions of the problem. The second area to consider is the type of markers we use to uh, to predict somebody's long-term unemployment. So they're geographic, demographic, psychographic, behavioral, and contextual markers. And again, they're highly statisticalized um, and numberified uh, representations of the person who is signing on. The difficulty with these, and I suppose I come from a business school where we're used to uh, writing about leadership, entrepreneurship, and marketing. And each of those three disciplines has for the, for the last 20 or 30 years, turn, it turned its back on the rigor and academic worth of trait-based analysis, the notion that somebody is a type of person and that has consequences for what they do. So there's no marketing company anymore that really uses geographic demogra demographic segmentation to determine who buys washing up soap. Um, 
And NAR, as leadership or entrepreneurship study, identified these mystical traits of people who make great leaders or, or become entrepreneurs. And I suspect at the end of this investigation, we'll discover that these markers are not there to be found. The third area that, um, that emerges as a, a point point at which we have to um, refine our conceptualization if we're going to bring it to the rigor of a rule-based system that can be implemented uh, without manual intervention is uh, the type of statistical models that are being made. The models, um, if you go back to the previous slide, have a reported self-efficacy of, at, at a high watermark, we've seen reports above 80%. Uh, but in general, you have to do data cleaning to achieve that kind of number. Uh, and some of them are as low as 50%, which means that they're, uh, I suppose, they, they don't work is, is the answer. And if you take, if, and people use the medical language of diagnosis and treatment, it wouldn't be acceptable for a therapeutic um, to, to, to make a diagnosis based on the kind of numbers we're seeing coming out of these models. And it may be the case that these models have a fundamental problem of comprehension. Is the labour market complex? So is it a complex problem in which we deploy more and more data and it becomes more and more understandable and knowable to us and more, more predictable? Or is it chaotic, as most markets are, in which when you add in more data, you get a temporary horizon of predictability until ultimately the world changes and the predictability is gone and the model breaks down. And if you say that the labor market is just a, a part of society and how we organize our social world, you would say that, that that's certainly the case. Like I've been talking about unemployment, the unemployment of before the 19, 50s and 60s era was male breadwinner unemployment, whereas now unemployment is a broader uh, administrative construct used by government that has become, uh, the gender politics of it is of course very complex, but it, it has become uh, more, well it, it as, as was not distinctively misogynistic as, as it used to be. We just the, ran a few more minutes. Right? Sorry? Just, just the two minute warning. Oh, right, Grant. Okay, I'll gatling on through this, sorry. Um, so then uh, in terms of the other, uh, the, the active labor market policy treatment box uh, has mixed reviews and the evidence for it is certainly mixed and there's very little consistency across the world of a set of techniques that work. And then finally, uh, all of this only works if you limit the consideration of these profiling tools to problems of the PEZ uh, departments uh, in government and don't allow it to impact on other politics. So uh, you think of things like um, the French uh, Gilets Jaunes, you think of what's happening in Hungary, what's happening in Poland and across Europe with the, the rise of the right, Brexit. This has political constructs, or oh, sorry, it has political implications. And those were the political implications that led to the rise of the first generation of unemployment. So the other two things I just quickly name check uh, is all of this is a work first, everyone must work construct, which I'm not sure we have signed up to as a society. And then the final point, and I suppose it's the money line from these profiling techniques, is that they're not cameras. They don't neutrally uh, take an objective photo of the thing that they uh, purport to represent, rather their engines that make and reshape, and indeed the title of your conference today is has reshaping in it, and that they reshape the experience of unemployment. So the invention of the ship, uh, as Paul Virilio once said, is also the invention of the shipwreck, and all technologies have their accidents. And it's really important at the design phase to start considering them. I'm just going to say one further thing uh, before wrapping up, which is um, what our work is trying to do. So we're uh, like having roundly trashed profiling, or at least surfaced the problems, because 
the, the challenge of the H2020 is that we have to take action and intervene to do something generative. We can't just enjoy a good old critical bash of profiling techniques. We have to respond to that. Is what we're interested in is looking at network flow. And we've a huge amount of data on the unemployed and we've relatively little data on those who are economically inactive, those who are employed and those who are self-employed. And the real challenge is to identify and statisticalize with an equal um, uh, care that we do to the unemployed to these other three statuses. And if we can trace then the flows forward and backwards between these categories, we can say that we have seen the labor market and we'll, have, we'll present a tool that is common in seeing other types of markets like the property market or the stock market things like liquidity, volume, rate, and volatility. And each of those will allow us to hopefully um, improve people's ability to self-allocate and self-determine uh, in the labor market. So I'll, I'll leave it there rather than uh, bashing on. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ray. And that was another fascinating presentation. I think both your presentation and Ludo's presentation have really drawn attention to some of the equity issues around profiling and the, the kind of coherency or cogency of statistical profiling uh, in, in PEZ um, and, and interesting tensions between the two as well. Um, and so we've now had two presentations which have really looked at AI in terms of um, the profiling of clients and targeting particular cohorts for early intervention. And we're going to move on now and think more about the role of digitalization as an online sort of job search support platform um, and as an online uh, substitute potentially for, for case face-to-face -face case management services that would have traditionally been delivered by public employment services. So the first presentation that's going to address this is from Simone Casey, who's a research associate, associate at the Melbourne-based progressive think tank per capita. Um, as well as an associate of the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology's Future Social Services Institute. And she's got a long-standing engagement with the employment services sector in Australia. Um, and uniquely, perhaps, from both the provider side as well as the job seekers side. Um, Simone has worked for the Australian Unemployed Workers Union, as well as serving for a as a policy advisor with the with Jobs Australia for many years. And Jobs Australia is the peak advocacy body representing not-for-profit employment services providers in Australia. So she brings a great wealth of, of experience to this issue and is, has also undertaken PhD research in her own right on, on job seekers and lone parents' experience of, of activation. So she's, uh, I would describe her as perhaps a pracademic and Simone has also taken the wisdom of pre-recording her presentation in advance because she's coming to us from Melbourne where we're competing with Friday Night Movies on Netflix. And Australian, Australia's broadband network is um, a little bit limited at times. So we're going to play the presentation, but Simone is with us today. So she will join in live for the discussion time. So. Hello, thank you for inviting me to be part of this interesting webinar. I'm really looking forward to joining into the, the conversation in person, but I've decided to do a, a pre-record on this presentation because I've been having some connectivity issues lately. I wanna to try to get it done before Netflix surge hour comes along in Australia. I'm Simone Casey, and I'm delighted to be here among such esteemed company and thank you very much for the invitation for joining. I'm going to be talking to you today about developments in online and digital employment services down under. Uh, digital employment services in Australia um, are going to be a new, the new big thing um, in terms of the next iteration of employment services. The next iteration is the outcome of a, the most significant review there's been since privatisation, and that's called the McPhee Review. And that resulted in this report uh, known as the I Want to Work report. Um, and it's a very important report because it 
heralds this beginning of a new age of employment services in Australia, where many of the transactions that were undertaken between people will be replaced by digital interactions. And the review involved consultation with a large number of stakeholders. And it's important to note that the Department of Employment has placed a lot of emphasis on engaging across the board. And uh, that's why I've included the quote in the report um, from Peter Shergold about uh, policy designed in isolation by public servants. So um, the recommendations of the fee review were that, uh, you know, a number of things about the employment service system needed to change, that job seekers had lost trust and em employers were not happy and that providers were overwhelmed with administration. This resulted in the development of what's been called the new employment services model and the digital employment services are a large part of the new employment services model and it has different elements for job seekers, providers and employers and all of this information about the new employment services model is up on our Department of Employment website which is employment.gov.au. I've got some links on the final slide that you'll be able to access this content as well. So the new employment services model the design of it is that there will be two stages of digital services before job seekers uh, become eligible for enhanced services. So enhanced services are for people who have been classified as having higher level needs um, and they will be serviced by face-to-face -face by employment services providers and uh, job seekers with lower levels of needs will be serviced in digital first or digital plus. And the way of streaming though, uh, people into those different categories of service will depend on their JSCI score, which is currently what's used to classify job seekers in, across the three streams of the job active system. So it's anticipated that around 50% of the existing job seeker caseload in job active in the future will be serviced in digital services. So the digital employment services component of the new employment services model was preceded by an online employment services trial. And this is where many of the technical or technological aspects of the employment, digital employment services has been tested out. So it's important to note that there has been some background work going on in trialing online employment services before the new employment services model came to pass. And the, indeed the findings from this online employment services trial are being used to justify the transition to digital and there's been various reports which have pointed out that the online employment services have uh, resulted in equivalent outcomes to the existing job active system. So what do these digital services look like? Well, for most job seekers, it involves the use of a digital dashboard, which is accessible either on PC or device. Um, and it's, uh, the digital um, dashboard is really the most significant technological uh, development that has led to the ability of the Department of Employment to provide these services online. So the digital dashboard has been introduced to job seekers over the last few years. It was introduced um, with, when the uh, targeted compliance framework was introduced. Most job seekers were required to migrate their appointment uh, attendance reporting and uh, monitoring of their job search effort and compliance with mutual obligation requirements online. So this digital dashboard has been around now for uh, nearly two years and um, it has been a tool by which job seekers have been monitoring their um, compliance with mutual obligation requirements. So you can see on here that when you log on to the dashboard it, it gives you an indication of how much of your mutual obligations you have complied with, whether you have um, any appointments coming up. And indeed, if you have not um, met your requirements, you start accruing demerit points, which will eventually lead to 
uh, the suspension, uh, sorry, the um, sanctions, suspension of payments occurs automatically. This is the targeted compliance framework element of the digital dashboard. There are other things that you can see on your, um, your device or your laptop when you're using the dashboard. Uh, and indeed, the Department of Employment has been developing a lot more um, complementary tools to go alongside the um, job search and compliance monitoring element of the dashboard. So I've, and this is a, a dashboard elements that job seekers can customize. Um, and it will, you know, also do some job matching for you and bring up some job ads. So the new employment services model was supposed to proceed in three uh, stages. From July to September 2009, there was the phase one of the digital first transition. So only new job seekers who entered into employment services at that stage in the pilot regions, and there's two pilot regions, uh, they are Adelaide South and Mid North Coast New South Wales, are two quite large employment regions of Australia. Um, so they began um, putting job seekers into digital first services at that stage. And from second phase in October 2019, they uh, um, also added a, a job seekers into digital plus and enhanced services. And the idea is to roll out this new employment service model progressively from late last year to June 2022, which is when it's anticipated there will be a wholesale migration to this new model. So the trial regions, as I said, were Adelaide South and uh, mid North Coast New South Wales, involving approximately 20,000 job seekers. As I said, these trials started in November 2019. Um, but those of you who've been watching the news will have also noted that, uh, you know, accompanying those trials was a very significant um, bushfire season in Australia. And in fact, a large areas of those trial regions were in bushfire um, territory and, ha and therefore the trials have been disrupted because of this. The other major disruption to the testing of the new employment services model has been the impact of COVID as it has been around the world. And this has meant that a large number of more job seekers than had been originally anticipated are now using online employment services. So at the moment, the Department of Employment calculates that to be around 400,000 job seekers. So what happens when you're in digital services? Well, you do your job pl plan sign up uh, online uh, and default mutual obligation requirements are populated into that online uh, job plan uh, according to the criteria set by the Department of Employment. Um, if you have difficulties with your online services, you can contact the Department um, of Employment's contact centre and they uh, can provide assistance to you. Um, and there are some elements of the digital services in which uh, requirements to participate in mutual obligation activities like work for the doll have been maintained. Um, and there's also requirements for job seekers to undertake employability skills training online. Um, and in the design of the new employment services model, there is a few new phases that we've yet yet to learn much detail, detail about for diversification in, and intensification of activation requirements. And other programs that there are in the suite of uh, activation programs in Australia run alongside the new employment services model at this stage. Information about the new employment services model has been distributed to the wider population through communiques from a reference group, which has been a place where information about the new services has been um, discussed. And so digital foundation training is one of the elements that's been discussed in that forum about which we have not had yet a great deal of public information. And the other element of the new employment services model that's important is the uh, points-based activation system. So this will be a new way of job seekers reporting compliance with job search requirements 
that's intended to be more flexible than the current arrangements, which is uh, by uploading proof of job applications as the only form of job search evidence that's been accepted. So points based activation is going to be a very uh, important element of the new digital model of employment services moving forward. These technological developments have not come without raising some concerns. Um, and here I've just um, provided a scatter of um, some of the newspaper headlines that have uh, are accompanied the implementation of the targeted compliance framework, work, which is the automated monitoring of uh, job search or, and mutual obligation compliance. Um, it, that has had a particularly significant impact on the population of um, participants in the program called Parents Next. Um, but it's also the, the targeted compliance framework which automates payment suspensions has also um, caused a, a great number, a great increase in the number of payment suspensions across the board, not just for Parents Next participants, but for job seekers in Job Active and other programs. We've been very lucky in Australia to have some very uh, solid interest from some um, of the newspapers. So I'm uh, pointing out Luke Enrique Gomez as um, somebody in the Australian media who's been doing a very good job of keeping an eye on these things, not only in employment services, but for the robo debt. Now, the main controversy that's accompanying the current use of digital, as I said, there's 400,000 additional job seekers than had previously been anticipated uh, in, employment, in online employment services at the moment. The main controversy is about whether leaving them in online employment services means that they will be neglected at a time that they might actually genuinely um, benefit from having some human interaction with an employment service agency. But on the other hand, the other side of the uh, controversy is that the job active system as we know it, it has regarded being regarded as a failure by many. Um, and I'm certainly one of the people who's been arguing that we should make the transition to the new employment services model sooner than later, because that means job seekers who don't need to be supervised by human beings in employment services agencies can get on with the job of looking for work on their own and only the people who genuinely need help will, will be required to be connected with an employment service agency which will have more capacity to help them because their caseloads will be reduced. So that's the end of my presentation. As I said, there's a large number of um, resources around that you can do some more reading about uh, digital employment services in Australia. Thank you very much. That's that's great. Thank you, Simone. And that's a, a really detailed overview in, uh, of what Australia's online digital by default employment services system looks like. And I think it's, it's really great to see some of those uh, applications in action in, in that PowerPoint presentation. Um, so we're going to round out the series of four, four presentations with um, Joe Ingold, Associate Professor in the Department of Management at Deakin Business School in at Deakin University in Melbourne. Um, she's there more in, 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 in spirit rather than in mind uh, at the minute due to COVID restrictions. And she's actually coming to us from um, Leeds in the UK. Um, and Joe Ingold's an associate fellow of the Digital Futures at Work or Digit Research Centre as well, which is led by the Universities of Sussex and the Leeds Business School, where until recently, as I mentioned earlier, she was an Associate Professor of Human Resources Management and Public Policy. And she's a leading international expert on employer engagement in active labor market programs. And I think what she will bring out some of her work in that area and its relevance to the digitalization agenda in this morning's session as well. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Jo. Thank you, Michael. Can you hear me okay and see my slides? Yes, all looking good. Wonderful. That's great. Okay, great to be here. And thank you so much to Michael and colleagues for organising this fantastic event. So without further ado, I will crack on um, and I'll start my own timer. So I'll try and keep track of my time as well. 
Okay, so what I'm going to talk about this morning is um, just to give a brief overview of policy changes in the UK and Australia. Obviously, Simone's given a fantastic um, overview there of the changes in Australia um, and is a, a, and obviously an expert in, in the Australian context. So I'm just going to sort of pull out some of the um, similarities between the two countries um, and then uh, move to the kind of uh, the main part of the presentation, which is more about unpacking the elements of digitalization and talking about the potential implications and also a, a, an overview of what the literature or literatures from different disciplines uh, tells us so far and how we can analyze some of these um, developments and then pose at the end some emerging questions. I think there are a lot of questions um, but I've just pointed to, I'm going to point to a few at the end of the presentation. Okay, so in terms of the UK and Australia, um, most I'm sure everybody on the call will be aware of universal credits in the UK, which has been around for quite a, a, well a number of years now and um, if you've been following the development of it you'll know that it's been beset by a huge number of issues both in terms of policy design and also delivery essentially it's a digital by default system so the idea is that we've moved to a system of a single working age benefit by merging a number of benefits in the UK and that the universal credit is basically the de facto um, out of work benefit for people of of working age and that it is claimed and managed um, digitally so it's the aim is to reduce the kind of personal contact with with Job Centre Plus or the Department for Work and Pensions as, as Job Centre Plus in its own right kind of no longer exists um, and alongside that there's been a rationalization of the DWP estate so mergers and closures of job centers in the last few years and I've, um, I've published some statistics on that elsewhere in a blog. Universal credit um, I speak as a former um, government researcher in the DWP many years ago so differently to how we used to do evaluations for the most part uh, universal credit it has very much been based on a test and learn approach so um, and a kind of agile way of developing as if anybody who's um, au fait with um, management fads and management speak will will know a bit about agile so that's basically underpinning the way that it's been delivered so the idea is that um, they kind of test um, on on the go if you like certain elements of the system and then the, the there are changes being constantly made to the system that are then communicated to frontline staff um, so it's it's seen as as being um, a lot more um, flexible in terms of the, the way it can respond to different and, um, to, to changes needed than the previous labour market system but that of course is is up for debate and I'm not going to dwell on that here just to say that 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 is very much underpinning DWP Digital's um, design and delivery of the actual service rather than the specific policy design I think it's important there to separate out the two a point to which I'll return later as to what comes under the policy design element and and how that um, that goes into the delivery and DWP Digital Digital is, a, is quite a, a discrete entity um, to the Department of Work and Pensions. We're also in the UK seeing some other digital developments. So there's um, discussion at the moment of a potential programme called Support for the Recently Unemployed, which will be um, digital only. So providing support uh, for around a month. So that's um, because we've just had um, the uh, huge employment services framework there's just been the closure of tenders for that um, with it uh, within the UK so um, we're waiting for, to hear who has got the contracts and who's on the framework for that and then we'll see a number of programs coming through of course we know about kickstart which is the the new program aimed at young people so we'll see more programs coming through so in terms of Australia, obviously, uh, Siobhan's given a fantastic overview of that. So I, I won't um, I won't kind of duplicate any of that. But just to say that um, there, there has, of course, been historically policy learning between um, UK and Australia, both ways, essentially. So um, so I think it's important to point out without going into too much detail, given time here, um, that there are similarities in the trajectories of the two countries. And of course, the UK um, is still one of the few countries 
countries that has a very highly marketized um, employment services delivery model, though not to the extent of Australia. And at this point, I just want to flag up that we have um, an ESRC funded COVID rapid response project called Welfare at a Social Distance. I've put the logo at the bottom of this slide and there's a link at the end of the slides where we are looking at the experiences of claimants to, um, to, to universal credit and other benefits, but predominantly universal credit to look at their experiences um, of claiming and also their experiences of, um, of employment support and in particular looking at the kind of support um, that people self-perceive that they actually need. So that's something that started in May um, and I've put, I'll put the link, I've put the link at the end of the slide so you can have a look at some of our publications so far. Okay, so what I want to do here is just to um, try and unpack um, digital a bit more because I think um, currently there are a lot of assumptions being made about what digitalization means and um, a, a question that I'll come to at the end is to what extent is digitalization really new? I was pondering this and thinking that actually there are some similarities to the concept of globalization where you get your hyper globalizers who, who argue that globalization is, is new and, and, uh, and something very different path breaking to what we've had before um, but equally we get um, other people who, who suggest that that actually it's a continuation of existing trajectories but the scale and the speed at which um, at which developments are happening it is the big change so that's something that that I'm not necessarily going to answer in this presentation but I'm just going to pose as a question but I think it's important within this to think about um, what is actually meant by digitalization so I've, I've I'm just posing three particular elements so at a basic level I think that there's the controlling and streamlining of processes and basically making um, digital um, processes that, the, that were otherwise done manually so for example universal credit the assessment um, and the whole um, uh, process of applying is um, is now digital and then there's of course the compliance aspect and and it's basically about in improving workflow essentially um, and Simone's already pointed out the compliance aspects there's also the next bit which is more automated decision making and um, basically that the premise of automatic decision making is that decisions made should be the same um, if um, because this there should be consistency basically if you're automating in decision making and that's one of the, the purported benefits of digitalization that I'll talk about shortly and then we get on to AI and machine learning where um, where basically you're not expecting the decisions to necessarily be the same because of course the data is learning from um, from data um, that is constantly input so I think it's really important to to make a distinction here because um, there's a danger not only of technological determinism and I think what I'd like to argue for is is where is that there is agency within this and I'm going to suggest where the agency may be but also I think there's a lot of conflation of the different elements of digitalization so I think we really need to be careful separating those out and to look at what actually the AI and machine learning elements are and what the and what's and unpack the elements that are not necessarily that are not the machine learning and I've just put there a reminder any Terminator fans there there's a nice picture of something like a kind of Skynet um, kind of um, so uh, what I'm saying is it's not necessarily all Skynet I think it's important that we look at what what are the chain what's different and what actually is a continuation um, of, of what's already been happening I know from the, a lot of work that I do with providers of employment services um, both in the public employment services but predominantly because of the challenges we have gaining access to the Public Employment Service for Research in the UK, um, the work I do with contracted providers who tend to be um, more open to uh, research access, interestingly. Um, I know from my conversations with them and my involvement in the, the, the trade organisations in the UK that, that providers have been using digital apps and, and other ways of um, of kind of what well, we'll put you could call it profiling other ways of assessing people's distance from the labor market not not in the the sense of us that australia does with the job seeker classification instrument but some variations on that and providers tend to have their own versions so here what i want to just uh, say argue strongly for as michael um has has nicely introduced at the beginning because because i've done a lot of work on employee engagement is i think it's important to remember that there essentially are three different customers 
that we're talking about here. So there's the, the customer's candidates. I try not to say claimants because I don't really like that word. And I've more recently been using candidates because of the intersection with, um, with, with human resource management and actually people applying for jobs as, as job candidates, but customers of employment services, whatever you want to call them. And then there's the government or the state as a customer and important employers who um, if you're familiar with with any of the stuff I've been working on um, it's it's kind of my obsession really is is the employer element um, so employers what I know from the research that I've done so the typo there it should have said viz SMEs but employers particularly smaller employers prefer personal contact what I know from the research I've done on with employers um, of their engagement with employability and skills programs is that in general employer engagement is based on relationships both inter-organizational within the organizations delivering employment support and intra-organization sorry intra-organizational within the organizations delivering and inter-organizational so between the providers and the employers so these are relationships built on trust trust has been mentioned earlier in terms of customers and um, and as i've mentioned um that there are ways that providers have actually um already been using assessment tools to try to assess customers distance from the labor market but as I've talked about in one of my publications rag ratings the red amber green as a as basic assessment tool was not the whole story that actually there was a lot more nuanced um, process of joining people up with jobs and with employers uh, beyond the rag rating so um, I've written about that in um, the article in 2018 and then an article published earlier this year um, I talked about employers frustration about receiving lots and lots of job applications and I think there's a real danger with digitalization that um, and, and certainly with universal credit and the way that works that there's a reliance on people spending 35 hours a week uh, um, applying for jobs and literally just applying digitally for jobs and just deluging employers which is not good employer engagement and it just frustrates everybody and and under that is the kind of conditionality and, and sanctions regime so I could talk a bit more about that but I'm conscious of time um, so I just want to map out here really that there's the digitalization elements and here because I've got an interest in both um, labor market policy and in human resource management there's a real it's important I think to highlight the intersection here so it's not necessarily a linear process but I've just pointed out here what the customer or candidate journey is and the employer because they're both they, they need to be both working in parallel um, and digital Digitalization can of course come in at the pre-employment preparation stage whatever that may involve in terms of activation um, importantly there's a lot going on in the recruitment and selection aspect and that's where we get into some interesting HRM literature that I'll briefly point out shortly in terms of uh, virtual HRM e-recruitment and all of that um, and then we've got the post placement support and then further down the line thinking about retention and progression and I guess it's fair to say in the UK at the moment that that the in-work progression element of universal credits has kind of uh, slightly been sidelined given um, given the current situation for obvious reasons. So that's just me trying to map that out um, because um, in a new project that I've got with my colleague David Robertshaw, who's on who is on uh, the call, um, we are going to be looking at digitalization of employment services in the UK and Australia, and basically mapping out the different elements through a provider survey in both countries and also with interviews. And what we really want to do as well, I mentioned agency at the beginning. What I really want to do is um, is to also talk to the technical experts because they for me that seems to be missing from a lot of the literature the sort of technical perspective and I think it's really important to think about who has the control here who's buying these systems are they bespoke systems are they uh, off-the-shelf systems what is their capability what's the driver behind them and particularly for the people who are doing the technical work so I'd like to see that's my one critique of Virginia Eubanks's fantastic uh, um, automating inequality is that there's not um, there's not a consideration of the, the the, the technical people within that the enterprise architects and I think that's really important so yeah, I probably haven't got just wrap up in about two minutes. yeah I will uh, Michael yeah great um, so basically um, we've already heard a bit about what the potential benefits are 
um, of digitalization. Um, so, and they, I've kind of balanced these out with the, with the potential risks as well. So while there could be decreased costs, there's also the potential for increased costs, for example. Does it really save costs? It depends what systems you have, whether they do what they're supposed to do. Um, in my, I'm just going to slip to the next slide, which is just a brief overview of the literature, but I particularly want to point out here at the MESO level, systems thinking and John Seddon's work, where he talks about failure demand, particularly in public services in the UK, um, but also elsewhere. So for example, contact centres, um, where the idea is that you're, you reduce your costs by, um, by sort of merging your back office functions and, and assuming that people will just phone up, get what they want, and that will be the end of it. But frequently, as his analysis points out, people phone up, don't get what they want and then what it does is causes knock-on costs for the rest of the system and I think that's you could argue that's that's what we see with universal credit with the issues that have been pointed out. So here I've just kind of mapped out some of the literature that I think is important. Paul Henman um, at the University of Queensland has been doing excellent work on the the, the kind of gov governance and e-government government aspects of um, digitalization. I think his work is really important and not nicely theorized. And then we've got the, so I, I've called that the sort of macro level and then drilling down to the meso level of policy design. But I'm particularly interested, as I mentioned, about this move um, of, of what it means, what digitalization means at that intersection of, um, of public policy and service delivery um, and, um, and the human resource management. And I think it's important that we draw on some of the human resource management literature here, particularly the critical literature about the issues with recruitment and selection um, and the biases within recruitment and selection um, and, and how those biases are increased if we, um, if we have um, digitalization and, and e-delivery. So, um, so just going, um, I haven't had time to go over all of it, but hopefully if the slides are circulated, you can look at my list of, of potential advantages and disadvantages and we can always go back to those in the discussion but I want to finish with just a few emerging Urging questions um, which might um, be useful for our discussion. So to what extent is digitalization of employment services new? Which elements offer ad potential advantages? You know, it could, it could be that in, in an ideal world, caseworkers have more time to actually spend time with clients. Um, but, um, but obviously, there are lots of issues around why it that it could be a disadvantage to have digitalized digitalized delivery if it doesn't work as intended um, and interestingly for us all i think how can we most appropriately research this phenomena and i've already suggested i think it's important that we uh, that we draw on different literatures uh, maybe outside of our own domains and and also speak to a variety of actors involved in this which is what um, david and i are planning to do with our project and then i've just got my references and some contact details Details, um, if you'd like to follow up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. And I think you provided really a, a very um, nuanced and, and broad overview of what you might say are the varieties of digitalization. Um, that's helpful to think about and you've brought in some good questions for us to think about in the discussion time going forward. Um, just a reminder that you can tweet uh, about this morning's session and, and this afternoon's session using the hashtag Digital PES with PES capitalized, so lowercase digital and PES, P E S, in uppercase. And also, please do submit your questions via the Q and A function um, in the Zoom call, and we will bring these to the panel um, in the discussion that's going to follow in a few moments. But before we move to the discussion, we've invited John Martin, who's the chair, current chair of the Irish Labour Market Advisory Council. Um, to, to comment on a couple of the themes that he, he might have picked up upon from the four presentations this morning. And the Irish Labour Market Advisory Council, to those of you who are joining us from international places, is an independent advisory body for the Minister of Employment Affairs and Social Protection and the Irish government. And John was appointed to chair this panel in April of this, this year. But many of you, of course, will know John as the former director of the OECD's Employment, Labour and Social Affairs Directive, Directorate which he headed from 2000 until 2003 when he retired. And he was, of course, the founding editor of the OECD Employment Outlook. 
and has advised the Irish and French governments on activation issues for many, many years and has a wealth of expertise to contribute to this morning's discussion. So I would like to invite John now maybe to offer some comments and then we'll move to the discussion. Thank, thank you very much, um, Michael. I'd like to thank both you and Mary for inviting me uh, to, um, and to, to this very interesting con uh, conference. Just before I make some comments, a quick disclaimer. Um, uh, the, you know, I'm speaking here in my personal capacity, not as chairman of the Labour Market Advisory uh, uh, Council. So just to make that disclaimer clear at the beginning. Now, I think the four presentations are really uh, interesting, raising a wide variety of issues. Ludo's presentation, I think, was particularly welcome because it deals with a very important topic connected with digitalization of, of pest services. That is um, the use of artificial uh, intelligence machine learning to develop uh, enhanced profiling models to identify those judged to be at risk uh, of long-term unemployment. And I think it's also a very welcome study because it uses a case study from the Flemish Public Employment Service, which is internationally recognized, I think, to be a pathfinder among public employment services in the European Union, unlike its uh, French counterpart. Now, the authors, I think, rather nicely show that the advantage of an artificial intelligence based profiling model in terms of its enhanced accuracy also contains uh, its Achilles heel. Because if the big data sets upon which uh, the algorithms uh, are trained contain discriminatory behavior, that will also be translated into the resulting algorithm. This is uh, another example of so-called statistical discrimination. And Ludo's uh, paper illustrates this very clearly when comparing uh, foreign-born job seekers with uh, Flemish uh, job seekers. So it would be helpful in my view to extend this work in a number of directions. I mean, I think a first important question which has been raised in other presentations is, how should the results from such uh, an artificial intelligence profiling model be used by caseworkers? If they are made aware, for example, uh, of the inherent statistical discrimination problem underlying it. Should they override it with their own subjective judgments, bearing in mind that they are likely contaminated by the same kinds of statistical discriminations that infect the big data uh, methods? And how can policymakers try to minimize the discrimination problem when considering to invest in artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning profiling models in order to avail of their uh, improved accuracy. So I think those are a number of, of um, important questions arising out of this very interesting paper. Now let me turn to the presentation by Ray Griffin. I must admit, I found this more difficult uh, to, to follow. Um, I liked the idea of the project aiming to identify an ethical uh, artificial intelligence machine learning algorithm. Um, this sounds very nice, but I did wonder uh, in what sense the word ethical was being used or would be used in this, um, in this context. And um, a couple of observations that Ray made um, raised some questions in my mind. Um, there, there was this, uh, a statement that the evidence-based, the, e the existing evidence base on active labor market policies that work is very weak. And um, I would dispute this uh, statement myself. And I would uh, draw 
your attention to the many meta-analyses of the evaluations of active labor market policies that have been carried out. For example, work associated with the names of David Card, Jochen Kluwe, Jim Heckman, Pierre Cahook, etc. I could multiply this. I think these studies have greatly increased our knowledge based on what works, what doesn't work, what works for what groups, and why. So, I, a second uh, comment is Ray rightly drew attention to the potential of looking at labor market flows uh, as distinct from labor market stocks and analyzing, if you like, the dynamics of transitions between the four uh, labor market states of unemployment, employment, uh, inactivity. Um, and, but I would simply highlight the fact that um, there, there has been much work uh, in the labor economics field on labor market flows dating from uh, the 1970s. And indeed, a lot of what I think of as the most recent uh, relevant research in labor marketing makes use of micro data between linking administrative data sets to uh, often sometimes to household survey data. I think what I find particularly interesting is that many OECD countries have been able to create linked employee uh, employer data sets which throw uh, a, a lot of light on uh, the transitions, uh, career pro uh, progression in firms, internal labor markets in firms, etc. So I would hope that uh, that work will uh, be highlighted in the work that um, Ray and his colleagues are, are doing. Let me now turn to the very interesting Australian case study by uh, uh, Simone. You know, Australia is really unique among OECD countries in that it abolished its public employment service over two decades ago and shifted to a contracted out model of employment service provision via a range of for-profit and not-for-profit providers. Now, while no other OECD country has gone as far as Australia in abolishing its public employment service, many have opted to contract out some employment services to provide private providers uh, under pay for performance contracts. Ireland, for example, has followed this example in recent years with JobPath and uh, the local development uh, committees. Now, I think many countries will be watching Australia again eagerly to see how its new online employment system works, whether it delivers good outcomes for its clients uh, and the public purse. Now, I have a few questions about uh, this new uh, online model. Um, the old system used a profiling instrument, the so-called Job Seeker Classification Index, um, in order to uh, uh, direct job seekers into different streams. Now, this is apparently being replaced by what's now called the job seeker snapshot. But I wonder, have any changes been made to the job seeker snapshot as compared to the previous uh, profiling instrument? And given the shift to, digital, to digital-based services, um, are there any plans, Simone, to replace uh, the job seeker snapshot with uh, an artificial intelligence machine learning profiling model. Second, I'm very curious about the points-based activation system for mutual obligations, which has been introduced apparently very recently. Just what does this involve for job seekers, the employment service providers, and Centrelink? I note that on one of your slides, you seem to suggest that sanction rates have increased greatly uh, with this new regime. This might suggest that uh, part of the shift is, uh, as I, to use the term, um, relying more on a stick 
rather than in some sense on effective active labor market policies to uh, enhance job search and career progression. My third question is, what does the introduction of this new digital based system entail for the providers contracts? Are there likely to be major changes to uh, these contracts in terms of the conditions or the pay for performance elements? And fourthly, will the shift to an online system uh, produce more consolidation among the providers? Because we've seen over the years with the Australian system that the number of providers has uh, diminished and the degree of market power of certain providers has increased. And finally, I, I, this is just a personal uh, guess. It looks to me as if the new model is motivated mainly by the desire on the part of the federal government to save public spending uh, on employment services, as opposed to seeking better work and career prospects for uh, job seekers. I'd be very interested in to hear Simone's view uh, on this question of the motivation. Last, just a, a few quick words about Joe Ing Ingold's very interesting presentation, in particular, uh, what's happening in the United Kingdom. Um, it's worth noting, I think, that the Australian example of contracting out found a very clear echo in the United Kingdom uh, with the work program though that was hardly an unqualified success. Now, subsequently, the UK uh, opted for a major innovation, that is to establish a single working age benefit called universal credit. Now, uh, this, the introduction and implementation of universal credit has proved to be a real nightmare, it seems to me. Uh, it's been running years behind schedule, and it's well over budget. And incidentally, uh, one of the main reasons for the problems with uh, universal credit uh, relates to the digital systems which were supposed to underpin it and to deliver real-time data to the benefit agencies and which have shown huge flaws uh, in operation. And I think it's <laughs> to Australia's credit that it is not tried to copy the United Kingdom and go down the universal credit uh, uh, route. I found uh, the slide that, that Joe presented listing the pros and cons of dig digitalization of employment services to be very helpful. And once again, this highlights very clearly the trade-off issues involved in uh, embarking on a major push to digitalize uh, public and employment services. Um, so let me just stop at this point, Michael, and I look forward to uh, the discussion. Thank you very much, John. And um, that's some, some great points that you've raised for discussion and consideration by the panelists. And I think in a moment I might ask Simone Casey to pick up on some of your uh, questions there in relation to the Australian system, the moving move to the sort of points-based um, conditionality system, uh, and she can answer those. We've also had a question from Kieran Reid asking about what the motivation or impetus for digitalization was in Australia, uh, which you've touched upon as well, John, in your remarks. Was it cost efficiency? better standard of service, standardization of triaging and profiling of job seekers. So Simone, we might invite you in a moment to, um, to, to make some comments about that. Um, and we've also had a number of questions uh, for Ludo and Ray in relation to profiling, which I'll just, just read out at the moment. You can think about those while Simone's uh, making her remarks. Um, there's a question from Janine Lesch, apologies if my pronunciation is bad. Um, the Ludo, have you also compared AI-based profiling with more standard statistical profiling based on logits or probits? It'd be interesting to see the difference in accuracy and fairness um, between those. Do we know, this is from Anna Dent, do we know if digital PEDs are using data from the private sector in their decision making? I'm thinking of the power of surveillance high-level by Zuboff, 
There are several questions about what accuracy means in the context of profiling tools. So perhaps Ludo, you could spell that out. And is whether AI is programmed with existing data um, or is it um, in real, real it existing historical data or learning from the cloud in real time um, and how that might feed into statistical discrimination and issues around that. And also whether Ludo, you think that the, the findings of your study are, would be unique to the Flemish context or would we think it would be replicated in other countries, particularly Ireland, given, given our audience. Um, so there's questions about the extent to which AI could perpetuate a marginalized prejudice um, based on the kinds of data that it's inputted in, into and what accuracy means in that context. But I might ask Simone firstly to, Simone, if you want to turn your camera on and to, to turn your, unmute yourself and, and can respond to a few of those comments. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. I was so terrified about connectivity issues. That's why I did my um, pre-record. Um, and I've got a lot of questions that I've been trying to answer partly in the chat. So forgive me if I don't respond to them all in the order that they were um, posed. Um, first of all, I just wanted to clarify that the job seeker snap shot that is used to stream people into digital at the moment is based on the same factors that was used in the old streaming instrument, which, which is the JSCI or the job seeker classification instrument. So it's still currently using the same factors that were already being used. Um, the second question I think was about points based activation. Now that has not been rolled out yet. So we still don't know exactly what that comprises. And my understanding is that instead of uploading proof of job search, which was the default was 20 job applications per month, that uh, job seekers will be able to upload other evidence of activity relating to job search, such as, for example, um, networking, um, you know, going to uh, meetings where other people are not not just proof that they've applied for a job and they and they have evidence of that um, which has been kind of a barrier to people being able to provide enough proof of job search in the past um, some of the changes in Australia have been driven by um, the digital transformation agenda which has been um, there's a digital transformation agency that is um, basically um, increasing the levels of e-government and access to government through uh, digital services across the board. You could say that that is partly driven by a, a cost um, efficiency agenda, um, and but it's also just the fact that these technologies um, are making these things possible these days. So I think it's a combination of those two things. Um, uh, about the compliance elements of digital, yes, it's certainly a far more efficient way of imposing surveillance on job seekers to make sure that they are meeting requirements. Um, Australia has a very strict attitude towards uh, digital obligation compliance. So I think there's definitely um, greater potential for the digital services to make greater efficiencies in the monitoring and surveillance of mutual obligation compliance. So I'm not sure if I covered off all of the questions there. Did I miss anything? No, that's, that's, that's terrific, Simone. That's, uh, I think you've addressed a lot of the points and I'll invite Ludo to come in in a moment. Um, another question in, in relation to the profiling tools uh, is whether social capital is factored into these models at all. Um, and uh, a question which all panelists might want to think about from Tom Bolin, is there any extent to which clients of various PES systems are aware of dig digital technical management of their cases as data and react to them, either to take strategic advantage or in forms of resistance? Does this informationalization of the clients shape them in some way? And a question from, from Thierry Hughes, I'm picking up on Joe's point about the need to understand the roles of the people building the systems um, and some of the concerns in relation to Virginia Eubank's work. Have the presenters found that it's possible to access these actors in different countries and to map the kinds of tools that are being used? Is the UK a particularly close case in this respect? So I might invite Joe and Ray to come in in a moment, but first we'll hear from, from Ludo on and the points raised by John and also some of the audience as well. So Ludo, if you'd like to come in there.
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, uh, John, and all others for uh, uh, the interesting comments and, uh, and questions. I'll try to give uh, short answers on it. Um, first of all, there was a question on um, the comparison that has been made in my study. Um, well, we couldn't compare with the uh, regression-based model because there, there has never been such a model in Belgium or in Flanders. But um, that's one of, of the, 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 the points that can, could be taken uh, in another context uh, where the two types of statistical profiling, regression-based and AI and machine learning-based, um, uh, may be compared. But, uh, in our case, it was not possible to do that. Thus, we made just a comparison to the classic rule-based uh, approach, so based on uh, one or more single uh, administrative uh, variables. Then um, there was a question about uh, data, uh, which type of data are used. Well, in our research, we used uh, existing data, yeah, of course, and um, if you mean that um, uh, for the AI model itself and the functioning of the model, which data are used? Well, at this moment, um, the, the version that is in place in Flanders uh, um, uh, um, uses the, the most actual data available. That means that each day, uh, the profiling score is being adapted and may change from day to day, every 24 hours. Uh, data from the private sector. Um, well, if you mean that um, if data from uh, private providers uh, who are working uh, with the public employment service, um, if those data are used for the AI model, then the answer is yes, partly, because part of uh, the data um, must be um, registered uh, in, the, in the governmental system, but only partly. Um, about the ultimate aim of this type of models, well, um, in the Fl in Flemish context, the ultimate aim uh, is um, to go further and to um, not just to give a profiling score um, and, and to, uh, uh, to give uh, a, a, a color code eh, to the job seeker, eh, red or joan or orange or green. Um, we are working with four groups, but also to give uh, suggestions for service delivery. Uh, for instance, uh, which type of training could be useful for this type of job seeker, uh, given uh, his or her profiling score. But in the actual context, and that's um, uh, ultimately it's a political decision, but in the actual uh, policy context, this is not obliged. Um, so the it, it, it are only suggestions and um, case workers as well as job seekers are free uh, to use them or not. So they are not obliged to follow them. So that's the official policy line at this moment. Although um, we all know that um, the difference uh, can become very thin and at a certain point of time, it can be a very thin line to turn into uh, a, a kind of monitoring and surveillance of job seekers. And um, so um, I'm not really convinced um, uh, about the, the ethical context at this moment. And um, there were also uh, interventions in the parliament in the beginning of this year on uh, the use of uh, the, the current model by VDRB. And uh, one of the decisions was that um, VDRB uh, has been asked um, 
to let uh, investigate uh, the algorithms used by uh, the PES, uh, but we, we are still waiting for the results of it. Um, they were used to do that because um, there are uh, some doubts about uh, the equity issue and the fairness issue. I think that were more or less the questions. Yes, uh, that's very good. Well, um, question, uh, please send me the question uh, also afterwards. Uh, you know, the conference you can always contact me by email. We will do. Um, Ray, would you like to add anything else uh, to the points on the I'm very happy to briefly respond to all of those comments um, and thank you very much for the engagement and uh, reflections on the, on the work. Um, we do a fudge on the ethics, you're absolutely right, ethics is a, a minefield. Um, we're a European funded project so uh, we just use the debate on the European Constitution uh, as the construct that we use around ethics, and that allows us to talk about the shared values um, that, um, that animate uh, the European project. And so we don't get into the minutia of, of that. Um, uh, we just take an off the shelf solution there. Uh, the second thing, uh, the comment on ALMPs, uh, it was actually Card, Cluve, and Weber's work that I was quoting when I was saying the evidence of ALMPs isn't rightly established. I think a very nuanced paper that shows, uh, and it's like it's great to see all this evaluation work coming on, but it does show that there's no uh, global standard for what, what constitutes an ALMP, what's inside, what's outside. And um, each country appears to still be improvising uh, very much based on their own context um, rather than a, a kind of coherent globalized uh, solution. And I think we're still some way away from that. That's not to say that that won't um, emerge and we're not improving and getting better at that all the time. But it is, to, I, I think, uh, Card, Cluvay's and Weber's work does, does reflect that. The third point, uh, flows rather than stocks. Absolutely. There's a really interesting and exciting debate in the labour economics literature. I don't think it's ever transformed into trying to build a tool. So the work that uh, went into understanding the nature of unemployment and the drivers of unemployment has become a tool in profiling techniques and it sits on the desk of PES employees, but there's no equivalent useful tool out of the labour flow uh, data. Now it's a very it's a very challenging thing to put together, and I, I don't know if we'll get there with it, but that's what we're investigating at the moment, to see if we can turn that inspiring literature into an actionable tool. Um, and one final comment on uh, the use of private sector data. Um, one of the researchers in the consortium has looked at using LinkedIn data, uh, which has a lot of um, information about the nature of the labour market, but of course that has its own biases. And really, very much every data source that you introduce introduces echoes of bias that unpick the universal construct of unemployment. And so we need to be very thoughtful about the type of data that is used. But we're, there's very, very little live, updatable um, kind of, uh, and they use the term AI, uh, but kind of sentient, like reflecting on itself, machine learning kind of. Uh, deployments of um, of data sets, and I think linking to private sector ones would be much more, much less stable for a PES to build a system around, rather than. So I think there's lots of kind of interesting issues with that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ray. And I'm conscious that we're, we're we're just reaching over time now, so I might just ask Joe Ingle to respond very quickly to that point about the issue of getting access to the people that are designing the systems um, and, and I think her experience with, with that issue. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, it's, um, it is a, a sense of in 
intense frustration for so many researchers both in the UK and elsewhere trying to research the UK that it is incredibly difficult to get access particularly to frontline um, Department for Work and Pension staff um, so um, but it's something I'm, I'm intending to pursue for the research that David and I are doing particularly in terms of DWP digital but not necessarily the frontline case workers um, and that's where actually the provider sector have been fantastic really in because there's um, yeah, that commitment to learning um, particularly through the trade bodies are so and the Institute of Employability Professionals um, so um, I think it's very concerning that the government department is sometimes not willing to give access especially when research is publicly funded and will contribute to important knowledge base but having in said that um, the DWP have collaborated very well with us on our welfare a social distance projects um, so um, so I'd say I would definitely encourage anyone wanting to research in the UK to um, to definitely uh, do their best to get access but unfortunately it's not easy it is far easier for me to go to Denmark or the Netherlands to get access than it is in the UK currently um, so um, but yeah don't give up and, and just I know there's a question about AI and fluidity which I think is really interesting and certainly something that we could pick up maybe later in the day as well because in theory AI should be able to pick up um, um, oh, sorry machine learning should be able to pick up fluidity um, of um, changes in data across the life course but um, and again that flags up the point of how why it's important to talk to the technical experts because it does rely on quality of data which the question also touched on that um, there's a phrase um, in um, amongst the technical experts basically about rubbish data in rubbish data out but they don't always say it that politely but I think that is really important about the data quality and um, that that we should keep an eye on as well thank you Thank you, thank you, Joe. And I just, on behalf of all the audience, I uh, would very much like to thank our four panelists today, Ray, um, Ludo, Joe, um, and Simone Casey, and also our discussant, John Martin. Um, the, it was a really rich and engaging discussion this morning, which hopefully we will continue on to the afternoon.